there's a fascinating divide in New York between Houston Street, I guess, the old New York, which those of us who are, you know, who grew up in the northern part of New York find com still completely impenetrable after 49 years, whereas the top part of New York, it's like a dream. You know where you are, you know how you need to get places. How did this happen? How did this miracle of planning in, in the northern portions of the city occur? The city was growing rapidly. It had a very dynamic port and the kind of higgledy-piggledy, or to put it more nicely, the organic growth that was happening in lower Manhattan was coming up against its limits. And the leadership of the city recognized that in order to propel the growth of the city, it would be much more effective to have some structured framework. And it wasn't just, I think, a road system they were thinking of. It was a broader development mechanism. And we have no documentation of their thought process whatsoever. All we have is the outcome, which they were required by the state to produce in 1811 in the form of three manuscript drawings of their plan and a very short document that explained their rationale. And what they chose was a grid that begins at Houston Street and rises up to 155th Street. That was their original vision. And the argument they made was Manhattan should have a plan that facilitated the economic construction of housing. And I think, though, they don't say this, but I think that they had Washington, D.C. very much in their mind. Washington, D.C. had been very recently planned by L'Enfant as the political capital of the country. And it was really a translation of the Baroque cities of Europe with many symbolic spaces, with great wide diagonal avenues leading from one monument to the next, leaving triangular spaces which the commissioners who knew about real estate recognized would be costly. And what they wanted was an utterly regular plan. And so rejecting these so-called embellishments, to use their language, they went for what they thought was a highly utilitarian grid. And it is utilitarian. I mean, walking around New York City is vastly easier than walking around Washington, D.C. It's true that you don't have the long sight lines and broad vistas. But on the other hand, you can get places quickly and you know where you are, which, which you know, in some sense, it allows the genius of New York to flourish in ways that make it much harder in a city of broad boulevards and, and fancy public monuments. But in calling something utilitarian, it is also often assumed that it means it's obvious or that there aren't ideas connected to it. And I would say that it was, while there was a great utility in the grid, there is also a driving vision. It wasn't, for example, the simplest thing to have done in 1811, because all of Manhattan was subdivided into private properties. Their city owned some land, but for the most part, private individuals like John Jacob Astor you know, owned property. So you needed to invent a process to take possession of land from private individuals in order to be able to build public streets. And sometimes people had houses on those streets. Exactly. The city had to invent a system of eminent domain. Mm -hmm. They didn't use the term, but that's exactly what it was with a, a court appeal process. So if people felt that their land wasn't adequately valued, they could appeal and so forth. They had to invent a bureaucracy then to build a road system, which wasn't a very straightforward thing to do. There are many steps involved. They had to figure out a way even to change the concept of what the responsibility and capacity of city government was in terms of creating this great public infrastructure, a system of streets that was the framework for growth in the city. And how much do we think that wheeled transport played a critical role in their thinking? The typical street in New York in about 1800 was probably 30 to 40 feet wide. The streets in the grid were 60 or 100 feet wide. So there is a significant increase in scale in the width of the street. So I think your point about accommodating vehicular traffic of that age was probably in their minds. The ports, both on the East River and on the Hudson River, were major points of entry for commerce, driving the economy of the city. So the commissioners surely were thinking about how do you facilitate the transfer of products from the ports into the city, through the city, and as well, how do you bring products that are produced in a city which is though people don't think of it now, an industrial city, a manufacturing city, how do you get those goods from those sites of manufacture 
to the ports for dissemination. An amazing thing. And something that still shows its power, right? There's a line of criticism that views all grids as the same and thus looks at the Manhattan grid as yet another boring example of a grid. But look close and you see that grids are very, very different. It's a genus in which there are many different species and it's all about the dimensions, the width of the streets, the length of the dimension of the block. And there is a genius in the dimension of the New York City blocks. There's also a genius in the way scale plays out over the stretch of Manhattan because over time there were changes in the grid. Broadway was built, other avenues were inserted on the east side like Lexington and Madison Avenue which were not in the 1811 plan. And yet I think when you walk through the city, what you feel is still the primacy of the 1811 grid, that that overarching vision still provides an ordering framework, even where there are moments of deviation.